Welcome. Today we're going to do a complete inspection of a office building with a condo located inside of it. As part of this inspection, we are only inspecting the one individual unit, but it's important that you look at the entire building and the entire building as its system. In this particular case, I'm gonna walk around the entire exterior I'm going to walk around all the parking lot and I'm going to do all of those items as I would do for any building. And you ask, why should I do that when I'm only concerned with the condo? So imagine you're in this condo, but your guests and your, your, your customers have to use this parking lot. If this parking lot was in terrible shape, your patrons and your customers aren't going to want to come visit you. If the exterior of the building had a less than perfect curb appeal, you're probably not going to get the customers that you're looking for. If the roof has problems, then don't you want to know that as an individual unit owner? Because the whole roof would cost a lot of money and I'm sure they're dividing that up amongst each. So that's why we want to make sure as we're doing this building that I might be only doing the interior of one unit. I'm going to do the exterior of this entire building. I typically start my exterior inspections or my general building inspections right at the access point, right where I drive up into the building. So let's get started there. I begin every commercial inspection in the exterior and I like to do it out here at the access point. This is where my customers are coming in. This is what should look the best. This is the first appeal, uh, feel they're going to get of my building. And first thing we see in life safety is a fire hydrant. Inspecting fire hydrants is, uh, is only a means of, do I have at least three foot of clearance around it? This one's wide open right in the middle of the landscaping. That's excellent. Our second piece of the exterior that I think is very important for us is you have to identify the signage for the building. I don't care about what tenant's name is, but is the address of this building uh, visible from the street? On this large sign, I've got its numbering on both sides. 1919. So even from distances, as a fire apparatus or emergency vehicle comes up, they'll be able to see the number. That's really, really, really important. So that's the first thing we want to identify. There are a lot of components and a lot of systems present on the exterior of any building, but there's probably not one portion that's as important as identifying the drainage and the topography. So when I look at this property, how is my drainage? Well, in this particular case, I'm high as I come in, and it's all sloping with a huge gradient towards the building. And so I need to try to verify and identify if there's any elements of that drainage that are gonna be in direct influence to the building. And then what happens around that drainage. I'll try to hit that as I'm walking through this entire exterior. I'm always gonna have that in the back of my mind. But moving past drainage, we always talk about in inspections, the big three. And the big three, you know, it's, and that is the parking lot, the roof, and the HVAC. Those are our big three items. So when I look at this parking lot, this is one of the bigger, one of the three items that costs the most to replace and has the most impact on the building. So does this parking lot suffice? Is it stable? Is it structurally sound? Well, this section, it sure looks like it. It looks like it's been well maintained. The curbing looks satisfactory. The asphalt looks satisfactory. The striping the, where the cars park looks satisfactory. And so for what I can see here, but I'm always gonna keep that in mind, I'm gonna walk this entire parking lot. If this was 10 acres of parking lot, well, I'm gonna walk 10 acres of parking lot. In this case, I've got about a half acre of, of walking to do. But we'll, we'll take a look at that. But as I'm gonna walk this way, I want to pay, pay attention to how does our landscaping work and how does it look? Now in landscaping on residential, you don't think of it so much, but on commercial, we absolutely do. So when I look at this landscaping, I can see where a lot of our undergrowth or under mulching is missing. We've got missing plants. 
We've got plants that don't look like they came back from the winter, that don't look like they're growing. This is springtime here in Colorado, and I don't see where, where they're, they're blooming all the way. So I would definitely want to let my client know that their landscaping is less than satisfactory. But then as we walk around, then I have the lighting. Just about every commercial building is going to have some sort of exterior lighting. In this particular case, my lighting has been placed outside of the driving area. So I don't worry about this light being impacted by a vehicle, which is good. But what's nice is this also has a very high concrete base. So a car won't hit this. It's higher than most bumpers. I do have a very nice bolt shroud here. And then I have my, my steel post. On the steel post is typically a, an access panel. That's for the lighting uh, electric. I do have a cover on that. I want to make sure I have that. And then I'm going to look at my light in general. If I was able to do on the interior of the inspection an identification of the light timer, then I would have activated that. In this particular case, during my preliminary walkthrough, I did not find that. So we are going to do this inspection of this lighting without verifying the operation. And I'll make sure on my report I note that for my client. But I'm just going to pass all the way through here and let's look at the front of this building. As we walk through here, I'm watching my drainage. I can see how the drainage kind of swooping this way. And it's going to assemble over here behind these cars. Sometimes I found that I can't see the drainage as well. I can't identify how it's, how it's moving around the, the property. So sometimes I like to bring out a golf ball. And a golf ball will be an excellent indicator and show me the flow of water. I can lay that on the asphalt and watch the golf ball move. And this golf ball is going to move around and show me exactly wherever the golf ball goes, that's where water is going to flow. And so I'll just follow it and, and it'll work out very, very well for us. Because at the end of the day, that water can cause great harm to the foundation, great harm to the building, and potentially if it pools and freezes, a potential ice problem and trip hazard for our clients. Speaking of trip hazards, my inspection's always in the back of my mind looking for barriers to accessibility. That barriers could be trip hazards, that barriers could be lack of a curb cut to bring in somebody that is, is, has a, a disability. And so I'm gonna watch for that as we go through here. One of our more common items that we'll have as an issue is our curbs will be placed and our sidewalks will be placed at a different time. And there are times where the curb doesn't move and the sidewalk moves. And this lip right here can sometimes develop into a trip hazard. And I've typically defined trip hazards as any cracking that's displaced more than one inch. That's a spot that's gonna have trouble. Where this isn't quite that one inch, this spot that I have over here is. I have a crack here and a lip here that is much greater than one inch. And this is a trip hazard. This would be something that I would definitely encourage my clients to address because you do not want to have a guest to your building trip and fall and have a liability issue. Then, as we migrate through, I want to start the exterior of my building. What I want to double check is make sure all exterior doors open outward and all exterior doors are at least 32 inches wide. So I would exercise the doors. This one's locked. I would open it up, make sure it opens outward. I can see the way the hinges are placed. This does open outward. I'm looking at our stone. I'm looking at our stucco. I've identified this to be a veneer stone. Veneer stone versus a structural stone. Structural stone, that's the item that is the structural element of the building. In a veneer stone, all this is is a cladding. It's a covering. It's siding. When we have veneer, we can have two types of veneer. One is a drainage veneer, and one is a, a, an adhered veneer. In this particular case, I don't have any drainage holes on the bottom of this stone. 
So this stone is affixed directly onto the substrate. So what we're relying on is this cap to drain water off. And so I don't see any issues here, but I see all that issue there. The issue on the bottom of the stone on these two columns is, is, is not structural. Because this is a veneer stone, it doesn't hold up the building. There's probably a steel or a wood column behind that. But in that same context, that's not attractive. And so that damage has occurred, and our, and our inspection is to note the damage, but it's not to note causation. My assumption on this causation would be, given the amount of salt that I see laying around here, it could be salt damage from de-icing. But I'm going to certainly note the damage on the bottoms of these two columns. The drainage on this property is tremendous. We talked about the slope in the, par in the parking lot. Well, then that slope goes, carries over into these troughs. And these troughs carry down into this detention area that's located below us. We're not quite at the inspection of the detention area yet, but I want to look over here. Again, I'm looking at my stone. I'm inspecting my foundation. I'm inspecting the siding. I'm looking at the windows. I'm making sure that this glazing strip that's in these windows is complete. This one shrunk a little bit and I've got a decent opening right here. And so I would definitely wanna, wanna illustrate that on my report. I might even go so far as to, to, to show that I can jam something in there and it'll hold or whatever for my inspection report. But I would definitely wanna show that. We're supposed to note any obviously fogged windows. And so as I look for that, I'm gonna look for fogged windows as we walk around here. And then lastly, how is my roof drainage? I'll do the roof in a little bit in another section of this of the exterior, but I want to look at my roof drainage and make sure that drainage is going away from the building. So over my other shoulder, I'm noticing a sewer cleanout. That is most likely the main sewer cleanout for the entire building. So if I was going to do a sewer scope, that's certainly a spot I could go into to see what's going out to the street. But then along the rest of the side of the building, I have got a sprinkler control system for the irrigation. And I've got the low voltage for the uh, data wire and the phone line. And those, are, those do fall outside of our scope. You could make a note that it is not accessible. Those do fall under the electric purveyance. And it does require a 36 inch by 30 inch by 6 foot 6 opportunity to inspect it called working space but it is low voltage and it's supposed to be something we don't inspect so i will just take note of it and i'll move on i'll do my best to look at all of these windows down this whole line but it's very limited access and so what i want to do is let's go check out this drainage this looks exciting so i'm watching this this drainage in the detention area i got a trough that comes down from this way and then behind me I've got another trough that comes down and I've got this deep concrete well area. I've got a retaining wall on each side. I need to inspect that retaining wall. I'm looking for plumb, level, square, straight. I'm looking for drainage holes across the bottom of the retaining wall to, to take the pressure from the hydraulic water pressure on the side and let that out. But then I've got this unique feature here. What is it? Well, this is an overflow chamber. So this area that we're standing in right now is designed to hold this much water during a rainstorm. And then it allows it to hang out for a while, detain it, put it in, in detention, so to speak, until it drains out slowly to the municipality. But if we get more water than this level, that excess water goes over the top and goes into this basin, and then this basin has a direct connection to the stormwater. So this area here that we're standing in is a temporary basin called a detention area, and then, and then it would eventually eva evacuate out to the municipality. But how does that water leave the detention area? Well, it leaves it through a series of these three holes. Now, we're not hydrologists. 
We're not engineers. I'm not doing any calculations. I don't know how many cubic units of water fill this basin based on how much rainwater comes down per hour. Not our concern. Our concern is if water comes here, how does it leave? And it's going to leave through a series of this hole, that hole, and another hole. My report though, I don't like the fact I don't have grates on these, and I don't like the fact that it's halfway obstructed with debris. Any debris down here in the detention area, whether it was piled up over by, over by the overflow or down in here, is a maintenance issue. And so I would like to see that cleaned out, and I'd like to see a grate on it so that it doesn't have the debris go in there. That'll be certainly something that we're gonna put on our report. But I'm gonna look at the drainage. And then I also see where I got this wash area right here, this is where one of the roof drains is actually coming down. Because that roof drain was evacuating on the sidewalk that's above us, they went under the sidewalk with the drain and have it evacuate down here. Very smart move. I would just want to make sure that I don't have any structural compromise with this erosion. We do not. But that's this detention area. Not every building has this. In fact, you could go most of your career and never see another detention basin just like this one, because this one was engineered for this property. But through intuition and deductive inspection techniques, oh, water falls here. Oh, water flies here. Oh, this comes here. Oh, we have drains and we have an overflow. I can just describe what, I, what it is, because we don't have to deal with causation but we do have to just describe what we see. That's what I would do down here. Watch for a plum, make sure these walls are solid, and then I think let's go back up to the top of this retaining wall and let's check out the rest of the back of this building. Carrying on with the exterior of the inspection, I've wrapped around this side of the building, I'm watching the siding, and I've come to this mechanical unit. I need to make sure I have a service disconnect, it's electric, so I gotta make sure I have the right clearance, which we do, and then I can look at this unit. Now, as I look at this unit, I have a model and a serial number and all that very important information right here on its label plate. This label plate will give me the name of the company, the model number, and the serial number. That's important because that helps me determine the age and the size of the unit. This is a Goodman. And so I see that this one is an 0404. So this was manufactured in 2004 in the fourth month. And then I can look at the model number and see that it is a uh, 48. And so, I can, or, and so I can see that it's a four ton unit. I take 48 divided by 12 and that comes out to four ton. So I can look at that. I'm not turning this on. Uh, but I am going to look at the physicality of it. All of these ivies and all of this shrubbery growing up inside of this shroud is an impediment. I'm not able to produce the cooling that is designed. Now, even if I can't test this unit because it's not on or it's the wrong time of the year, I can still identify all these conditions. And the fact that it is a 2004 and we are in 2023 today, that means it's 19 years old. At 19, it is statistically beyond its normal service life. And so I would certainly tell my client, even though it might be working today, they should anticipate and budget for its replacement. And so I'll look at the siding, like I say, I'll look at the walls. I was again echoing the, the conversation of the landscaping between the impediment on the uh, mechanical unit and ivy growing up against the building. This is all overgrowth and something we would want to talk about. But then I've also got a GFI. I will test it. So, so let's give it a test. Yep, it popped locally right here. So we'll test it. Make sure the cover's on. And then we'll just continue around the building. As I said out in the, at the beginning, even though we're only inspecting Unit 5, I'm gonna look only at Unit 5's mechanical, but I'm gonna look at the entire building. So I am gonna migrate all the way down 
the entire length of this building and note all of those deficiencies. Our first would be right here at this back service store. When we get inside, we're gonna watch for the weather stripping. When we get inside, we're gonna look to see how it swings. But outside, I'm gonna look for the normal structural damage. I'm gonna look to make sure I don't have any rusting going on. This door looks very good. I'm hoping when we get inside, it looks just as good. The other thing to note is it has to swing outward. And this does swing outward. This is our secondary means of egress. This is our safety door. And so we have that, we come out here. Now, we have to be concerned with safety hazards. We have to be concerned with trip hazards, but this is not a customer area. This is more of an employee area and employees can fall too. So as we walk down this entire length of the building, we are gonna be making sure that we pay attention to trip hazards or any other things that might be present. So we're gonna walk the rest of this building, it's a long building, and I'm gonna stop and we'll point out anything that might be interesting for us to look at. But let's just take a, take a nice walk like we do on an inspection. Again, I'm watching the windows. I'm watching the window gasket seals. I'm looking at these steel grates. These steel grates are part of the inspection. They have to be here so somebody doesn't fall over. And so I'm gonna to look to make sure that they look secure, they look solid. Again, windows. This ivy is absolutely noteworthy. Ivy growing up on the building is a, is a harbinger for insects and moisture and leaves places just simply, you can't see them. And that inaccessibility is something that you should note. So I'm gonna do that, looking at my veneer again. Now one of the things I'd like to point out to my clients is you don't know who visits your building, is we do have a lot of insect activity. Flying insects, specifically stinging insects. And you don't wanna be responsible for having a patron come to your building and then they get stung and they're allergic. And so noting that these, these stinging hive areas, these, what, these nests, that certainly be something I want to note on the report. And I'd just take a walk. Obviously we're missing a cover on this receptacle here. So I would want to, I want to make sure we note that. Um, I'm not going to necessarily test the electric on it, but I am going to note that missing cover because that is a safety concern as well. Pretty benign. And again, your client can just take this information as information. Certainly not their unit, they're not gonna fix it, but at least they know that there's issues going on on the outside of the building, which is indicative of the long-term maintenance that might be present. But this veneer, the veneer stone can have its issues. And most of the time, when we have an adhered veneer stone, water can get behind it, not be able to get out. And the freezing and thawing of that water can cause great issue to the stone. And in this case, water has gotten behind here and cracked this. I know this is not structural. I know this is not structural because when I look at this, I can actually see the foundation below. And the foundation below looks good. If that foundation below was cracked in the same as this, and then that's why you wanna make sure that you, uh, you identify these conditions. So that's what I'm gonna watch for. Most likely this was water that came in around this window, got behind the stone and froze it and caused it to pop. But we'll continue our walk. This is a, a nice little trip hazard here. Like the one we had in front, this is a spot where the sidewalk is settled a little bit. And so that sidewalk that's settled a little bit, it does need to be feathered out to prevent it from being a trip hazard. We've got a little bit of rumble noise from the air conditioners that are running uh, on these units. Since this is running, it'll give us a great idea if ours was running, if we're pumping out cool air inside, I should feel warm air outside. And so I could put my hand here, feel the warmth of this. If this was warm here, then I know I've got cool inside. I'm moving the cool air from the outside, pushing it inside, taking the warm air from the outside, inside, pushing it back outside. So this feels pretty warm, but if that was our unit down there, I'd be pretty comfortable with it. But now we come to the, uh, the gas meters. We have five units in this building. And with five units in this building, I have five gas meters. We are supposed to note 
that these are labeled or not labeled. I don't see on any of these five any form of labeling. I don't know which one of these goes to our unit, which one goes to a different unit. So my report would take a picture of these, identify the fact that it's not labeled. Then I would also note the fact that we have some rusty pipe. Those pipes aren't coated. And I would, I would recommend that they be coated so that we, uh, we don't have any rust or any degradation going on with, uh, with the gas pipe. But let's move around. I think we got some more things on the other side of this building that could be exciting. Let's go take a look at those. Now we've come to this side of the building and on this side of the building, we're greeted with our main electric gear. Now over here on, on the left, that's our main disconnect for the entire building. That shuts off everything. So one hand movement of this way kills the whole building. It's been labeled as 120 volt, 208 volt, three phase, four wire. That's what's labeled right there on that. I would take a note of it. Now, so many times we look at electric and you forget that that same basic rule, 36 inches deep, 30 inches side to side, and six foot six or 78 inches tall, that's what we need for height. This bush prevents me from having my 36 inches. This bush prevents me from having my 36 inches. So I would want to take a picture of this and note it. Then I have all six of these meters. Six meters. We prefaced this entire inspection by identifying that there are five tenants. Why do we have six meters? Well, we have six meters because one meter is called the house meter. And that's running probably the exterior lights and the exterior safety devices. So that would be the main for the whole building. And then each one of these meters would be for your individual. So I have house panel, LP3, LP4, and here is LP5. And so when I look at LP5, then I could open up this and I could actually see the disconnect right there. Now what I can't see is its size. I can't read that, know how big that is. I'm not gonna pull that out and disconnect it. There's not a breaker there to tell me exactly how many amps there is. So I'm just gonna note that and be done and hopefully figure it out on the inside of the building. We probably are not gonna figure out and understand what the main amperage load is on this building, but at least we know where the disconnect is, where the meter is, and we're gonna note the safety issue that's around this electric panel. I think let's move over to the front of the building. We know how important backflow preventers are and we'll see them around the building. This backflow preventer here is for the irrigation system and not for the entire building. I will take a note of that, but I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try to note where the backflow preventer is for the whole building. If it's in a spot that's not accessible, we're not gonna be able to find it. We might not even find where the water meter is. We might not find where the main water disconnect is. We might not have access to it but at least we know that, uh, that we do have a backflow preventer on our irrigation. Now in the same context, as we walked around the entire back of the building, we're back here at the front, and again, I'm watching drainage. I'm watching the drainage come down, and it works just like the other part of the building. It's coming down the hill and coming to here. So we'll just continue that same plan, continue that same drainage, and then we're gonna continue to look at the front of the building. Now again, in the front of the building, we're gonna look at the stone, the windows, the siding, the soffit. We're gonna, look, we're gonna just make sure everything's in good shape. On top of that, right, we've got another window that's got a lot of shrinkage to it that's gonna let water in. Certainly a maintenance item here. People don't think about that very often, but I think that on a commercial, that's important. Again, this is not our unit, but we note that the doors open outward. We know that the slope looks okay. I've still got some masonry problems on this column. I've got some masonry, column, masonry problems on the next column. All of these uh, are, are germane to our inspection. And we can continue this the rest of the distance. But before we do that, I think we need to talk about the roof. This is a sloped roof building. And on sloped roof buildings, we are not required to walk them. And in fact, the Comstop says that explicitly. We only walk roofs that have a permanent means of access. And we do not walk sloped roofs. But you do still need to inspect it. 
Now, there's nothing on this sloped roof that you couldn't inspect from the ground that you would find on the roof. So why not walk just on the ground? Why walk on the roof? Why, be, why, why put yourself into a dangerous condition? So let's go stay in the parking lot. Let's take a look at this roof. Let's see what we can see. Let's move over there. So as I inspect this roof, I can do that all from the ground. I can see 100% of this roof. I can stand here and I can survey this entire width of this roof. And then if I need to go someplace else, I'll go to another spot and look at the same thing. I'm looking to see how the shingles are resting. Are they cupped up? We do have some raised shingles. Are there some shingles that have been replaced? I do have a small section of shingles next to the valley over the top of this, uh, of this front section here that have been replaced. Those are the things that I'm gonna look for as I do my roof inspection. And so I'm just gonna look very carefully Note the raised shingles, note the damage, try to guess the age. Everything else in this building has been 20 to 25 years old. I'm gonna say the roof is 20 to 25 years old. Now I could use other methods. I could put a drone in the air. I could put my ladder up against the building and go touch the roof. Or I could put a stick in the air with a camera pole and do that. But I do not have to walk this roof. So for my clients, I'm absolutely gonna talk about the raised shingles, and the fact that statistically this roof is approaching its normal term life. They should keep an eye on it. Because remember, roofs are part of the big three. And those big three again are parking lots, roofs, and HVAC. It's an often over overlooked item of the exterior. It's the garbage corral. The garbage corral, you don't think about, but it is critical to have it be a safe item. I like this garbage corral because first I've got these bollards and this prevents anybody from hitting it. Hitting it, it would include the garbage collector. And then I've got a nice door system on this. This door system could be locked should they desire. One of the most dangerous items we have on the exterior is that open garbage bin. Whether it's a dumpster, whether it's a small bin, whatever it is, a child could climb in there and fall in and be entrapped. But so having a, a lockable, closable, secured garbage corral is important. So I, I really like that. You could comment the fact that it's rusting. You could comment that, 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 that these aren't yellow. But at the end of the day, I think they look pretty good. So we're going to want to take, just take a general picture of it and talk about the garbage corral. We've walked around now the entire exterior of the building. And before we go inside and start our interior inspection, I just want to summarize real quick what we saw. So let's start with the roof. We saw that there was a few raised shingles. We saw that there's been a section of the roof that's been replaced. And we saw that the roof is probably approaching its typical statistical term life, being it's around 20 to 25 years old. Walking around the exterior of the building, we've got some stone damage, a few trip hazards, a couple of typical cracks, and that huge detention area for drainage in the back. Remember, that has to be kept clear of debris and put some drain caps on those three drains so that they can block the debris and keep that flowing. Then when we come out to the rest of the building, we've got a few windows that would benefit with some sealant. Uh, and I thought the topography going around this building was pretty strong. We're all going to that detention basin. So with that, Let's start the interior uh, inspection of this condo unit. We're finished with the exterior, so now we're gonna come in and start the interior of the inspection. Before we get started, though, I wanna make sure that you don't have any other questions for me. No? Excellent. So as I go through the interior of this inspection, just so you know what we're doing, I'm gonna go around the outside of this room. I get to check a sample of the outlets. I'm gonna look for any issues that we might have, and then, when it's all done, during the preliminary walkthrough, I did examine and did find a small water stain. So I want to make sure that I take a look for that water stain. So let me get started over here. I'm going to check some lighting first. Check the switch. I have an outlet tester here. My outlet tester is designed to show me polarity and whether or not I have any issues. And so if I have two lights that come on, that's in my tester that tells me it's working perfectly. If I had just one light on, that would tell me something. If I had no lights on, that would tell me something. If I had a red light, that would tell me something. So this little outlet tester is really a handy thing for me. 
I like to watch to make sure I don't have any water stains or blemishes. As I walk through the interior of any space, I'm looking for plumb, level, square, and straight. That's our structure. And so I'm trying to identify those, those items. That's in my walk. That's in my eye. That's in my ceiling. And then I would come to a door. During the inspection, we should open and close every door. What's nice with opening and closing doors is it really gives me an inclination of, of structure. If the door is bound or the door is binding, then that says some things might be moving. In most cases, most doors are hung pretty well. So I just want to make sure the door operates. That is part of our ComSOP is the, is, the, is the open doors. I notice our thermostat is here. I'll address the thermostat a little later during the HVAC, but I did see this now as well as during our preliminary walkthrough. I look at this. It is beyond our standard to have to identify safety glass. But something like this could have safety glass. Sometimes it doesn't. But we are supposed to look for is obviously failed thermal pane windows. So I look, these look good here. I'm going to look for moisture stains that might be under the windows, moisture that might be accumulating in the corner of the window. This is a very popular spot, especially with these wonderful blinds that we have. A, he a heavy cellular blind like this might hold that heat very well. And it's a good chance for moisture to sit right here. And this, this looks very satisfactory. I'll check another outlet. That is excellent. There's nothing in the standard that defines random sample. You get to determine that. So if I walked through this inspection and found this outlet to have an issue, then I would probably check the next outlet to see if I've got something that's local right here or something that's more systemic across the entire electric system. So I've checked that outlet. That looks good. I find it important to look under every window, not just some windows. I look at every corner, not just some corners. And then that tells me about moisture. And in this case, we're looking good. That window looks satisfactory. And then when I get done with this, this I would repeat this exact process in every room of this building. So just because we did it here, I do the same thing in the next room, and the next room, and the next room. But before we go any further, I did see a stain. I saw that stain right there, and that's an interesting stain for me. And I want to see what's going on up there. Now, before I do that, I think we need to have a quick conversation about moving suspended ceiling tiles. It's not necessary. It's beyond the ComSOP. You could very easily note stain tile and move on, and you would be absolutely correct. In my case, I want to look up there, so I'm going to cautiously and carefully put a ladder up there, and let's take a look. So I'm going to carefully climb my ladder. Now this is where you got to think about how you're going to do this. I like to push the tiles a little bit, see what moves, see what doesn't move. I don't want to force something. If this is not a tile that moves up, yeah, it is. I slide it over, and then this is where I want to take a look to see if I see anything going on. So let me take a look. In this case, I don't see anything up here. I don't see any origin of the stain. What I do have is a piece of electric conduit that migrates there. It's very possible we could have had some condensation or something else in that electric conduit. But I don't see any evidence of a stain on the fire ceiling that we have above us. And so that's very good. So in this particular case, I just take a picture of it, talk about a stained tile, and then I'll go to the next room. You've repeated that same interior process through the next room and the next room and the next room, and you meet a restroom. I say a restroom. In commercial inspection, we call them restrooms, not bathrooms. I don't know why. Let's just call it a restroom. And in this particular case, I'm going to walk in. Per the ComSOP, and per the standard, you're supposed to flush the toilets for a representative sample. I flush it. I always like to make sure I shake it, make sure it's solid to the, to the ground. 
a solid mounted toilet, probably won't leak. This looks good. The tank looks good. And then I come to my wall hung sink. Wall hung sinks often have issues of support. So I just put a little pressure to make sure it's solidly mounted. In this case, it is solidly mounted. I put on the cold water, make sure I have cold water. I put on the hot water, make sure I have hot water, make sure the hot water is on the left and the cold water is on the right. And then I look at any other systems in this room. I have a towel dispenser, I have grab bars. We are not doing an accessibility inspection. But if I have something installed like this, I want to put a little pressure on it. And then lastly, I have a GFCI. Now, I want to give a little bit of advice. I do have an outlet tester. It's a great outlet tester. It's an outlet tester that does have a GFCI pop to it. And I think that's great. But if I use the popping mechanism and I have a GFCI like this one, then it pops, it's local, I'm great. What if this was a normal conventional outlet and I pop it with my GFCI tester? Well, it might test or pop some other outlet somewhere downstream in the electric. And in doing that, I have to find it and I'm not going to find it. And I've left now this inoperable. So I typically will only test a GFCI if it's local right here. And I typically do it either with my tester or my finger. We are supposed to test GFCIs. But be careful if you go into a room like this that should have a GFCI. It doesn't. It looks like a normal receptacle. But that GFCI might be somewhere else and you might not find it. So pay a little bit of uh, uh, care as to, as to thinking about what happens when you pop it. Then lastly, if I've checked, check, checked that out, I've done this, I turn on the fan. And hopefully the fan comes on, it evacuates anything that happens in here out to whatever the desired location is. And once I've done that, I shut the fan off, shut the light off, and I move to my next space. I might have one, 10, 50 restrooms in this building. Luckily today, we've just got the one. Now moving through this office space, we come to a door. It's a solid steel door. During our preliminary walkthrough, I did identify that this is the mechanical room. But when I look at this, I'm sorry, it's a wood door. But when I look at it, it's, it's a solid door. So immediately, my brain has to go into inspector mode and think, where does the combustion air for this furnace come from? And when I first walk into this room, I have a beautiful combustion vent up high coming from the attic space. Well, that's good news. Even though we're not required to calculate or identify combustion, as an inspector, we know, as inspectors, we understand how much combustion is important to the operation of a forced air gas furnace. And so that was the first thing I want to identify as I walk in this room. Then next, as I walk through this space, I got to think of the general principles and the general things that we find for any HVAC equipment. And the first thing that greets me is we're supposed to have 30 inches of clearance. That's 30 inches of clearance to the front of this. So all of these items that are here impede our opportunity to, to get in and inspect this unit. Now whether or not you want to do the next steps, that's up to you. But on this particular unit, I'm going to move this table. By moving this table, I now have access. You can choose to not move it, you can move it. In this particular case, while it's not 30 inches, I do have the ability to get in here. I've identified that this is a forced air gas furnace. I can see the unit right here. Now one of the things that I need to identify is, do I have access to it? Can I get to it? What are the components that are uh, readily accessible? Well, on this particular brand of unit, they've designed it so that it, uh, 
it is attached on this front cover by these two screws. I find that to be a very typical method for attaching this unit and it doesn't take any extraordinary work. While it could be deemed as not readily accessible, I'm identifying as something that is very easy to do, easy to do and I'm gonna take these two screws off. Now, I might have done other inspections where I don't take these screws off and that would be a unit that might be different than this one. But why I take it off is by removing this very simple cover provides me access to the interior of this cabinet. Inside the cabinet, I've got my four burners, I've got my induction motor, I've got my pressure switch, I've got my fan limit switch, and on top of that, and probably the most important thing we have, is I do have my label. My label on this provides me the manufacturer, which is Goodman, the date of manufacture, which is located in the serial number. This particular serial number says 0401, so this was manufactured in 2001, and it gives me the size. The size of this unit is 90,000 BTUs. Now, should I want to deep dive a little further into this, then it also provides me with the maximum temperature that should be in the system, as well as some of the other operating controls. Now, if you listen to the system very carefully, we are running right now. In fact, we are running in the fan. So, so right now the fan is blowing, and for us to test the heating portion of this furnace, all we'd have to do is exercise the thermostat and turn it on. Should you not want to exercise the thermostat and turn it on, because it is in a mode that is not heat or not cool, you could just simply say the unit was running in its fan switch. Now one of the things to consider when inspecting a unit like this, this is a forced air gas furnace. We've identified that it is a 2001 model year. If you look at systems like this in the context of statistics, the statistical age or lifespan of this unit is 15 to 20 years. We are currently doing this inspection in 2024. I'm sorry, I lost a year on us in 2023. So 23 minus 01 is 22. This is statistically beyond its typical normal life. And so by letting your client know to anticipate replacement of this unit in the near future is something you could do. While we don't have to comment on age, most inspectors use age as an identifying factor for expectations. So again, this is a 2001 and statistically 20 years is its lifespan. So this unit is at least one or two years beyond that. So it's something to consider. The electrical inspection in a commercial property is not like the electrical inspection in a residential property. We are not required to remove the dead front panel or the panel boards from these buildings. But it is very important when you inspect these that you make sure you can do so in a safe manner. There's a couple different ways that you can do this. One, by using the back of your hand, you can detect any static electricity. That static electricity would be an indication that we might have a fault inside, something electrifying the cabinet. Or you could use a non-contact tester. This particular tester that I use vibrates if I come into electrical contact. Packed. And if I come into contact, it'll make a vibration. I'll show you by putting it in this outlet. This light's flashing and this unit's vibrating. So that would tell me I have live electricity. Obviously, in a receptacle, I do. So once I've determined that that panel is safe to be able to remove, I will open it up. When I open up a panel, I'm looking to make sure that all of my breaker openings are filled. I don't want any open breaker elements. I make sure I have labeling. 
We do not have to verify the labeling is accurate. We just have to note the labeling is present. And then I look and I double check this panel. Now this panel is labeled panel L5. When we were outside, I found the main switch gear for the building and we saw the disconnect for panel L5. And so all I'm doing is being able to carry that back to here and verify that we are in the right panel for what's outside. Now, the other thing on, on inspections we need to be careful of is our safety. Now, there are two elements of safety I want to talk about. One is working space. That's the space we can safely address this unit. That's 36 inches from front to back. That's 30 inches from side to side. And that's 78 inches top to bottom. That's our working space. So these items that are stored here in front of this panel impede my working space. So this would be something I would take a picture of and note. Our second thing would be dedicated space. And that's the space that is required above these panels. And there can't be anything within six foot of this panel or to the firewall, which is not electric. So everything in here is part of the electric family. This would be fine. But on my report, I am definitely going to take a picture of the label, the labeling, the panel, and then my deficiency would be the stored items that are located here in front of the panel. Think about that, and we'll have to repeat that same process over and over and over at every panel we inspect, but we do not have to take the covers off. While it might not be a traditional kitchen, for this office, this is the kitchen. This is the break room. We have cabinetry. We have plumbing. I have a fridge, a microwave. I have outlets to test. And so these are the things I want to make sure I do during my inspection. I'm going to test this outlet. Perfect. I'm going to look under the sink. Excellent. And then what's interesting under this sink is we do have our water heater. Our water heater is this small gray box. And that is a small on-demand water heater strictly for this kitchen and the restroom that's behind it. And so I would want to make sure that I document the water heater, make sure I've got hot water, hot on one side, cold on the other, make sure the drain works, I check the cabinets to make sure they're tight to the wall. And that's really, while you might not think it's a kitchen, it's a kitchen for these people. So treat it as such and uh, move on to your next section of the inspection. So then as we migrate through, before we go down to the basement, I do have this rear service door. This is the door that, you know, the, you got a front door, you got a back door. We have to be able to get a second means of exit. And it's really important when you look at these service doors, I look for a couple things. One's the weather stripping. You might say, weather stripping, what a mundane thing. But it's interesting about weather stripping is if I didn't have a good weather strip on the bottom of this door, that air loss of that cold air wanting to come into this warm space starts to decay and damage these side frames. And that's what becomes expensive on the replacement of these doors. So I would want to make sure I look really, really carefully at the weather stripping in the bottom of this door and it looks very good and then I exercise the door nothing more complicated than that and then from there we can head downstairs this building does have a basement and so we do want to walk through the basement we're looking for structural problems water entry anything else that might be present including even electricity we could have open junction boxes we could have all kinds of things and a lot of people especially our clients are going to come down and they're going to see this this huge mass of all these wires they're going to go what are all those wires doing oh they're all strewn around they're all loose well those in fact are data wires those are low voltage wires those are wires beyond our standard those are wires we don't inspect those are, those are things that might be running modems or phone lines. So I would follow that through. Check an outlet. Perfect. Might check another outlet. Perfect. And then I want to look for any other damage that might be present in the foundation. I'm going to look for cracking. I've got a very typical crack here. A little shrinkage crack. I'd probably take a photo of it. 
let my client know about a shrinkage crack. I've got a small repair down here. This is probably a construction blemish, something that happened with, as, uh, as they were pouring the foundation, and they thought that the blemish was large enough that they wanted to, to put a patch on so nobody had a conversation about. I've got this window here. This window is, is not an escape window, but it could be. I could throw something through this window and get out of the basement. It just doesn't open. I do have a small crack here with a little bit of efflorescence. The efflorescence does give me a little conversation about moisture. In my mind, efflorescence is a byproduct of moisture, so I will call it prior moisture conditions present in the basement, just so that they don't think this is perfectly dry. There is some occasion that happens with that efflorescence. I just migrate through again. I've got another large patch here. And then I would follow myself to the beam and the rest of the structural elements, which lead me over to this other corner. This other corner is interesting and a great conversation for your client because during construction, it would appear that they put a pit in, a drainage pit, but they never ever put the pump in it. So it's never been activated. Now, all of these items here block my access. And so I will take a picture, talk about it being blocked, but I'm also gonna comment to my client that they do have a drainage pit available to them should they ever want to activate it by putting a pump in. So that would be something I'd take a picture of. And then I would carry on through the rest of this foundation looking for moisture, plumb level, square and straight. And then at that, we would go back upstairs and I got, a, I got two or three more things that I want to do on this inspection before I say goodbye. So let's go check those out upstairs. I had said there was a couple more things I wanted to look at. And one of the last things I do as I'm vacating out of building is I start looking at the life safety elements. And the first life safety element that we have here is our fire extinguisher. Now, every building should have a fire extinguisher. Technically, there should be a fire extinguisher in no more than 75 foot intervals. That way we're, we're close enough to any fire uh, device. In this particular case, I take a picture of the label. This label says that it was inspected in December of 22. This is 23. It's well within its label plate, so it would be satisfactory for me. So I note that. But the other thing I want to note is I've got this exit door next to me but I don't have an exit sign above it. I don't have an emergency light in this room. So if we lost power, I can't see. And if I can't see, I don't know how to leave the building. So not having an emergency exit light is important. Not having emergency lighting in this area is important. Both of those I take a look at. But then I think we need to take a little wider gaze. Let me talk about that and let's go into the next room. So if I don't have an exit sign there, and then it's not over the top there, and I don't have one here, I'm equally stuck. And then not have an emergency lighting in this area. That emergency lighting should activate whenever there's a power loss and should have an internal battery that lasts at least 90 minutes. And so not having emergency exit lighting emergency lighting, and then even on the front of this building, when I come out to here, I don't have an exit above this door. But then way out here in this vestibule, there is a light. But by the time I found that vestibule light, I got to go through this door. And this door, when closed, is opaque and completely invisible to what's going on there. So it's kind of one of those prime examples of this building was approved by the municipality when it was still a vacant shell. And then when we build the interior, it's very possible they never came back. We're not an inspector having any authority. So my inspection report is supposed to note, per our COMSOP, the absence of emergency and exit lighting. And that's all I'm going to say, is we're missing exit lighting in our back door, we're missing emergency lighting in our interior, and I'm missing an emergency exit light here at our front door. 
It's important when you do your inspections that you look at that broad scope. Some of that you probably saw during your preliminary walkthrough, some of that you saw during your inspection. But then that gets us down here towards our end. So that brings us to the conclusion of our inspection. I close all my inspections with a really quick summary. So I would talk about the small stain we had in the interior that we could not find any evidence of where it came from. So it looks like an old stain. I have the poor clearance around the electric panel. I have an older furnace. And then on top of that, we have a, a, a pit put in the basement without a, without a pump. Not that that's an issue, but I'm just trying to round this out. And then lastly, for safety, I would recommend that you consider adding emergency lighting and exit lighting. Beyond that, I wish you the best in your inspection and make sure you look in your email. Your report should be in your email box by tomorrow morning at breakfast. <laughs>